Welcome again. My name is Donna Hassler, director of Chesterwood, uh, the home studio and gardens of Daniel Chester French. I hope you've all had a chance to wander the grounds and visit his studio and residence here at Chesterwood, as well as visit the outdoor sculpture show. Our contemporary sculpture at Chesterwood exhibition has been running for Oh, many years, since 1978, actually, and we have had over 500 sculptors exhibiting outdoors here. And one of those sculptors are here with me today. Leonda Freudlichink um, has exhibited here uh, at least six times, and we invited her to be our guest sculptor this year. We felt that uh, her work is uh, important and she has done many things in her career which we're going to talk about today um, with our questions and conversations and we hope that all of you at the end of uh, my questions will also have some questions for her and I'm going to give you just a brief biography on Leonda. She lives and works in Rosalind, New York is largely self-taught. She's been creating sculpture for more than 70 years. In New York, Fink has exhibited at the National Academy Museum, the Sculpture Gallery, Century Association, American Numismatic Society Museum, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Century Association, the Cast Iron Gallery, among others. Her solo and group exhibitions include shows at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Whitney Museum in Stanford, Connecticut, the Newark Museum, Dallas Museum of Art, Cedar Crest College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and the Elaine Benson Gallery in Bridgehampton, New York. Besides her figurative works, Fink is also recognized internationally for her design and casting of metals, which she has been making since 1986. Her sculptures and medals are in the collections of the Smithsonian Museum's Nat Natural Portrait Gallery and the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., the British Museum in London, England, the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia, and in many private collections throughout the United States and Europe. Her work has been reviewed in the New York Times, the National Sculpture Review, and the American Medallic Sculpture Association catalog. <coughs> A self-titled book of her work, photographed by David Finn, was published by Rudier Finn Press in 2006. In addition, Fink has taught at such institutions as Nassau Community College, the Newark Museum, St. Martin's College of Art in London. She was the recipient of the J. Sanford Saltis Award of the American Numismatic Society and received a gold medal from the National Sculpture Society. In 1994, she was elected an academician of the National Academy. Welcome, Leonda. Thank you. Thank it's you wonderful very much. to have you here. Thank you. I, I didn't realize I had been so busy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Donna Hasler and Ann Cathcart and all the staff here who have been so helpful. And thank you. And it's absolutely an honor to have this exhibition because I have um, strong feelings about um, the, the being part of the history of sculpture, being part of the history, the way going back to Cycladic, going back to uh, Egyptian, and or, or there's a line, a red thread that runs through history, the history of sculpture. And I feel very much a little teeny-weeny piece of that, of being part of that line, or hoping to be. So you've been a sculptor for over 70 years. What drew you in particular to the three-dimensional art form of sculpture? The wrong reason. <laughs> Everything I've done, it seems, was done, I thought, at the time for a very good reason, only to discover a few years later that there's a basic error there. And what brought me to it, <clears throat> I, I was part of, can you hear me? Okay, excuse my voice, the weather is not helping it. 
uh, for many years, from when I was in my early teens, I was drawing the figure and going to life, life drawing groups, constantly drawing. And um, all the other students, all ages, some of those classes were WPA and wonderful. And uh, so many of the varied ages of those students, everyone talked about painting. They're all painters. And they, in all the breaks, they were talking painting. And I never thought about being competitive. It really scared the hell out of me. And here were all these people painting. I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something that let a few people do. It'll be safer that way. It'll be better that way. Totally the wrong reason. The, uh, the underlying reason, no doubt, is that I see three-dimensionally. I've always got to get the feel of going around the forms. And although I love color, the thought of dealing with all those colors and what to do with them was daunting. So that's all the wrong reason, of course. Absolutely. And it took me several years to discover that I can't, I can't think flat. Let's talk about your technique as a sculptor. My understanding is that you work directly in plaster versus the more traditional method of modeling in clay, uh, which is the method that Daniel Chester French used. He would first model in clay, and then the clay would be transformed into plaster, and then he would continue to work on that form until he was satisfied. Can you explain your working methods and how your technique defines your art? Yes, very much. Um, I always worked in clay in a group. You know, if we had a model and a group of people working, fine. Um, and uh, I found <coughs> that I could very quickly, I have, I have something called facility, which can get in the way. It can be a, a hindrance. You, you put a few marks on the clay, and it looks pretty good. And it's almost convincing. And then afterwards, after I cast it in plaster to get something more permanent, um, it was such a nuisance to start working on it all over again. And I found myself chopping and destroying so much, I destroy at least half of whatever I do. You know, build it today, hit it with a chisel tomorrow. It's always on the floor in pieces. And it seemed ridiculous to have to go from one medium to another, especially since I did not like my facility. It was too tied to the absolute real. I didn't, I didn't have the competition of the medium. The medium needs to fight back. I think it was Matisse who said that it's always a dialogue between his painting and what he wants. There's a constant dialogue, a constant fight, really. It says, do this, you say no. And after several days of struggling, you say yes. Uh, so I chop everything up. <laughs> so that's what led me to plaster. I found that I could get more freedom and not be so painstaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, your work flows, and it's, it's evident that the technique is how you find the expression in the object itself, through the technique. Yes, probably, yes. Yeah. Because <coughs> there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a certain amount of freedom in chopping something up and throwing it away and knowing that you're going to do it differently, hopefully better, tomorrow. And in that process, the plaster is difficult. It's wet plaster. It has to be, I start using it with my hands. 
<coughs> and then I use tools, then I use chisels, then I chop half of it off and throw it away. Does it dry very quickly, the plaster, uh -huh. or you have an opportunity to? No, it dries quickly and I don't care. You don't care. That's another people say, but it dries, how can you work on it? I'll, I'll cut it away, I'll file it away, I'll use various kinds of rough tools mm -hmm. to grind some of it away. But it is, I'm so busy trying to make the plaster work that I don't get as involved with thinking about how, how expressive it should be or how whatever else it should be. That I discovered after many years, the expressiveness or the feeling comes there anyway mm -hmm. because it's who I am. But it took a lot of years to learn that. So I have to trust it, let it happen. And the medium is so precarious sometimes, so not willing to do what I want, that I'm all wrapped up in trying to make it work. And what, what happens aesthetically or expressively will happen. <coughs> that took a while. All of your works are female in subject matter. Why do you choose to sculpt women in particular? <clears throat> I started out because there were female models more available. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know, I was thinking about this question, because it's always asked. And what's the matter? You don't like men's bodies? Ridiculous, of course I do. But uh, basically, all the sculpture I was exposed to growing up, I went to the museums by myself, very young, and I uh, enjoyed them. And all the female nudes were either sexist seductive. Um, they mostly were done by men. And I just felt it was, I want to get the emotion, the feeling of the person. And I don't want any superficial you know, imposition of an attitude. So somehow it made it better for me to take the female form and make it not so seductive, not uh, sensuous, not sexist, certainly, but inner feelings. The other reason I think is that women as models, or just women I know, show, express their feelings more readily than men used to. I say used to because today's men are more open to, many of them, to expressing how they feel. And uh, uh, I also find that the woman's body, because of that, is more expressive. Mm. Um, I look for gesture, gesture of the body which defines what's going on inside. There are things we don't talk about that we feel, things we don't show, we think. But our bodies give us away. The body speaks. And if we look for those, those expressive gestures, then it helps me find what I want. Very well put. That's yeah. exactly what I see personally in your oh, work. Oh, good. <laughs> I hope all of you do as well. You previously exhibited your work here at Chester Wood, as I mentioned, six times since 1989. How does it feel be, to be back at Chester Wood as our guest sculptor after a decade? And seeing your work once again in this heavenly place, as Daniel Chester French described it. He's right. How does it feel? Uh, it is absolutely an honor, a great honor. 
and uh, I couldn't have asked for, I didn't even think of something as rich, rich in honor and tradition, although I'm not that traditional necessarily, at least I hope not. And um, it's the most beautiful place to exhibit. And the people who come here want to see sculpture. I mean, I watch people in a museum. They walk by and they look at the sculpture frontally. There's no back. There's no dimension. They just walk by and they look. Then they walk to the next one and they walk again. Too quickly. And it burns me up. <laughs> I mean, I like walking down the ramp of the Guggen, I might like to give some of them a push. <laughs> so, you know, it's, that's not the way you do it. You, you have no idea what's in that, that way. Well, I always encourage people when they look at sculpture not to be timid and walk around it because there are so many interesting views. It's a three-dimensional art form. <coughs> look at it from the back, look at it from the side, and perhaps, yes, the sculptor had one view in mind, or maybe not. Maybe you'll find another view that's more appealing to you or more interesting, but it, to explore it uh, all around. Basically, I see the sculpture as, figure sculpture, as a shape in space. It displaces air. Mm -hmm. And it might be a very odd, funny, strange discovery when you look at it from another view. And if you go far away, it's some kind of an abstract form. And that form is fascinating. When you get closer and closer, you see that the body is doing something mm -hmm. or saying something, which you didn't even take into account before. So somehow it works that way. It takes time to look at sculpture. Yes. People don't have much. Well, I, I, I encourage them when they come to Chesterwood. That's why Chesterwood is so great. They're going to be looking at sculpture. Yes. And they're going to see other people going slowly. And they can walk around it. And take the time when you come here. It's absolutely, for me, it's a highlight showing this show at, Sculpt at Chesterwood, a highlight in my long career because I have so much love and respect for the fact that Chesterwood is here with people who care about the same things I care about.